Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 22 if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 22. That's where I'd like to read to you from. Praise the Lord. Matthew 22. Good to have everybody here. Appreciate you coming on Friday night. Spend your time with us in the presence of the Lord. Let's see if God will come down and talk to us and help us in this service tonight. Praise the Lord. The book of Matthew, chapter 22, we'll begin reading with verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. Boy, I like that. I'm not going to dwell right there too long. I'm glad it's in there. They went and gathered as many as they found. Did you see what Jesus said? Both bad and good. Whew. I don't know what column you was in. I was in the bad category. Praise God. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to, his, to the servants, Bind him hand and foot. And take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let's take, take a little time here. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 14. I think this is one of those parables that Christ often used. And there will be a, a, some differences in Matthew 22 and Luke 14. But I think that... Uh, this is one of those uh, parables that Christ would often use to teach about the, the kingdom of heaven. In Luke chapter 14, we'll begin reading with verse 16. Let's back up to verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, this is Jesus speaking. A certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord those things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. 
For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Praise God. I know there's some differences in these two stories, but there's some great similarities in these two versions of this parable. Let's, let's talk about this together if the Lord would help us. We're going to concentrate mainly on this wedding and uh, see if the Lord will help us. Would you lift your hands and pray? And ask the Holy Ghost to walk among us here tonight. Church said amen. amen. Turn around, shake your neighbor's hand, tell him I'm going to help Brother Teague preach tonight. Don't you tell a lie, you're at the house of God. You ought not be lying anywhere. Praise God. Now, if you said it, you're obligated to do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Jesus is talking in parables again, as he so often did. And in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, he's specifically talking to them about the kingdom of heaven and to describe the divine invitation that's going forth for men to enter into or be a part of heaven's kingdom, he uses the story of a a king that is making a a marriage celebration for his son. And in the parable, he describes how that uh, the servants were sent forth to call those that were bidden to the wedding. Pay particular attention to that in verse 3. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidding uh, bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now, uh, we've got to understand that when this uh, man, this king, sent the servants out uh, to gather those that had already been bidden to the wedding, this did not take them by surprise. They knew the wedding was going to take place. They knew the invitations had already been sent. The date had already been set. Preparations had already been made and all that they was required to do was to show up their presence at the wedding. Praise God. Amen. They had already been invited. They had already been bidden. Amen. But the Bible, the Bible said in so many words here, and they would not come. Hallelujah. Again, the scripture said he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner My oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. Verse 5, but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. Over in the book of Luke, uh, in our scripture text in the 14th chapter, the Bible said that all of those that were bidden uh, with one consent began to make excuse. Hallelujah. One of them said, I bought a piece of ground and I cannot come. I've got to go see it. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I cannot come. I've got to go prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. Hallelujah. Uh, the, uh, the, the relationship in these two parables, the thing that connects them together. Uh, I seen the, the, the willingness of the king, amen, to have the, the servants come to the wedding. I saw the willingness of the master, amen, to have those that had been bidden to come to the supper. Uh, but I saw in both parables the unwillingness of those that received the invitation to purpose in their heart to make their presence known at the supper or at the wedding. Hallelujah. Uh, this is going to be real simple here tonight, and if God will help me, I'm not planning on keeping you long, but my heart today has been on the invitation. Hallelujah. The invitation. The invitation is divine. Praise God. Amen. I can invite you to come up to Carolina and eat with me at my supper table. That would not be a divine invitation. You can invite me to come uh, down to Florida. Amen. And uh, fellowship you. That would not be a divine invitation. But Jesus is teaching in both of these parables that a divine invitation has been sent forth. Amen. Come to the wedding. Make your preparation to be there. Come 
come to the supper, make your preparation to be there. I know that when you uh, look uh, deeper into these parables, uh, amen, especially Matthew chapter 22 uh, and Luke chapter 14, the scriptures that we read, uh, Jesus is talking to the Jew. Uh, He's talking to the people in his generation uh, that were a part of his chosen people. Uh, The Bible said he came unto his own and his own received him not. He has given this parable to those Jews to help them understand that you have received the invitation. You were the first ones that were bidden to come to the wedding. You were the first ones. You received the first invitation to come to the supper of the master, but you refused to come. You refused to show up. Other things in your life was more important, and so God is going to go into the highways and hedges. He's going to send his servants Uh, for the halt and the lame, uh, uh, for the sick, uh, amen, or for the whosoever will. uh, And the Gentiles uh, is going to receive the invitation, uh, amen, while you're left outside. Uh, He told them it would be a place of weeping uh, and gnashing of teeth. He told them uh, it would be a place of outer darkness. Uh, Oh, but listen, folks, it goes uh, a little further than that. Uh, This divine invitation uh, that I'm preaching about tonight uh, It's still being issued. The cry is still going forth. There's a wedding about to take place. And we're all invited to go. There's a supper about to take place. And we've all been invited. Hallelujah. Amen. I've seen what uh, these men did. These that received the invitation first. The Bible very clearly said in verse 3 of Matthew 22, and they would not come. They just stubbed up on God, if I can say it that other way. They just stuck their feet in the mud and refused to, uh, to be a part of this great wedding celebration. And when the the king saw that this first group would not come. He, he sent another group of servants out. Hey Amen. Uh, uh, come to the wedding. He, and he put great emphasis on the preparation that had been made for the dinner. He said in verse 4, My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. In other words, the king sends the servants again. And he says, You mean to tell me after all the trouble I've went through to make a place for you at my table and still you will not come after all of the expense that's been put out for you to have a place in the celebration and you've got more important things to do you've known about this it's not sprung on you it didn't take you by surprise I've killed the oxen I've killed the fatlings of my flock things are ready all things are now ready. Hallelujah. I'll tell you something, folks. That king in our parable in Matthew chapter 22, he gave his very best. He made the best preparation. He put forth the money, the time, and the effort that it would take to be a good host for those to come that were bidden under the wedding. But this second time, the Bible said they made light of it. And one returned turned to his farm and one to his merchandise. One thought plowed his fields or reaping his harvest was more important than the honor, the invitation of the king. And another thought mind in the store or counting his money was more important, amen, than honoring the invitation of the king. Oh, we can learn some great truth from this portion of scripture, folks. There's still an invitation going forth Amen. Whosoever will, uh, let him come uh, and take the water of life freely. Uh, But there's still a world uh, that's filled with excuses. Uh, Still a world uh, who makes light uh, of the invitation. Uh, But after a while, uh, only those who are willing, uh, those who have made ready, uh, those who are looking forward to the supper, uh, they're going to be the ones that get to go. Hallelujah. I... uh... Uh, it's been on my heart today. I got to thinking about folks that I've seen drift through here. And uh, 
it settles down on me a lot. Different churches that I preach in. And it bothers me that we are living in a time when lost men and lost women can come to church and sit through service after service. They'll hug your neck. They'll call you brother and sister. Come on now. Sometimes they'll give you a little sugar on your jaw and they'll smile and they'll act like everything's all right. And they've been coming around so many years. We've just accepted them as one of us. Come on now. But there's people that come to this church, that drift through this church, uh, amen, that is not saved. They are not born again. Uh, They've heard the invitation, uh, but they've made light of it. Uh, There's more important things in their life uh, than to make preparation uh, to stand before God. Uh, I'll tell you something, sir. Uh, Maybe you're here tonight. Uh, The best thing you can do, uh, the most important uh, preparation in life uh, is to make preparation to stand before God because after a while amen every one of us is going to stand before him and every one of us is going to give an account of the deeds that were done in our body every one of us is going to be judged after a while hallelujah I wish you'd scoot in here a little closer and help me church can you imagine making light of this divine invitation. I don't care what some of you say. You'll never convince me if Barack Obama, when he was president, would have invited some of you to the White House, you'd about broke your neck to get to D.C. You didn't agree with anything he did hardly. But if he invited you, and you know this going to be picked up by Fox and USA Today, huh? He gonna give you some little honor, some little certificate or piece of paper. You'd have, boy, you'd have put everything on the back, but you'd have put you'd turn your whole life off. Just to get a work. Yeah, right. I'm going to White House. Come on now. Amen, he said. You might as well say it too because you'd do the same thing. What if Trump summoned you to come to the White House and he's heard about your faithfulness to Bethlehem, how you come and what a good mom you've been or a good dad you've been? Come on now. Hey, man, listen. If he said, get there tomorrow, I won't talk to you Sunday, then Sunday church service wouldn't mean nothing to you. You'd be home right now packing your bags, getting ready to head to D.C. Come on, say amen. You'd get your bargain in your snow boots and your gloves and you'd be heading north. Ain't that right? Oh, but listen, that's a carnal invitation. That's a worldly invitation. That really don't mean much of anything in the grand scheme of things. I'm preaching about a divine invitation, a divine appointment, amen, a divine call. What could be more important, amen, than hearing the voice of God and obeying the voice of God? God, and doing what God says to what could be more important than sitting around the supper table of the Lord in heaven Amen. what could be more important than that huh oh God well I got to thinking about it and it got to burden in my heart today I got to thinking about how folks make light of the things of God this divine invitation And they made light of it. Come on now. It gets worse. That next group of servants that returned with that emphasized invitation, they abuse them. They mistreat them. Come on now. Uh, uh, Listen to what the Bible said. Uh, The Bible said, And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Come on. Jesus, remember, he's talking to the Jew. Amen. He's telling them what what they're going to do. In one place he told them, uh, uh, just like your fathers have done the prophets. Come on now. I believe even Stephen even told them after Pentecost, uh, you're just like your fathers. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. Uh, You're just like your fathers. Come on now. He said your fathers killed the prophets, uh, and that's what you're going to do. Come on. Uh, Amen. 
listen, that, that was then, but this is now. Uh, amen. Uh, Jesus is saying that uh, those that have the message uh, are going to be slain. Those that come with the invitation uh, are going to be poked at and pushed aside uh, and made fun of. Come on. Uh, oh, but listen, there's a group of people uh, uh, that'll be cast out uh, into outer darkness. Come on now. Uh, oh, but there's a group of people uh, that'll accept the invitation uh, and they'll gather themselves together, uh, both good and bad. Uh, amen. And they'll be wedding at the wedding uh, and they'll be furnished with a garment. Praise God. Uh, I want to be in that bunch. Uh, amen. I want to accept this divine invitation. What could be, what could possibly be more important? I uh, probably talked about it here before. Well, I'd like to preach to you. I would. I, my grandpa Teague would talk about anything. He was, he died in the mid eighties, uh, and he was eighty seven, I think eighty six, eighty seven, somewhere in there when he died, and uh, he had, he was so old that uh, when he was in the army, there was still a cavalry division in the army. I don't know if there still is or not, but. And my grandpa, when my grandpa was young, don't, don't misunderstand me, they wasn't running around in horse and buggies. But he still took care of mules. I don't know what them mules done in that army, but my grandpa worked in the stable taking care of mules. Huh? I know there's tanks and helicopters and everything probably, but somehow he was in the cavalry. And grandpa was so mean. When he got out of the army, went back to the mountains in North Carolina. I thought it was, uh, you know, a little comical uh, in a worldly kind of a way, I guess. I looked them up on the census. They were from Allegheny County, North Carolina. It's right up in the foothills. And it uh, borders Virginia. And uh, they were from the uh, Sparta area, a little place called Trap Hill, North Carolina. And I, I got on my computer years ago, and I looked. I looked up Grandma and Grandpa on the census. I, I was nineteen thirty something, and uh, every just every that whole county, when it said occupation, it said farmer, 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 farmer. You know what that's doing? That's growing corn to make moonshine. The whole county, nearly, it was the moonshine capital. A North Carolina, that's what Grandpa did to raise his family. And he was mean. And uh, he was so mean, he killed his best friend with a pocket knife. They was fussing over who could make the most liquor with the least amount of sugar. Huh? Well, that sounds like a great way to live, don't it? Oh, God. He spent time in the penitentiary uh, on the chain gang making roads in North Carolina. Seven years for killing his friend. My great-grandpa on Grandma Teague's side was a doctor uh, up in Sparta. And he spent all the money he had to get Grandpa out of the penitentiary. Went broke. Lost his farm, his home. Spent it all to get Grandpa out. Come on now. Huh? So Grandma wouldn't have to raise seven youngins by herself. Come on, say amen. He's a mean feller. And he didn't mind, listen, he was my hero when I was a boy. He didn't mind telling you them old stories about different things. He, he'd talk to me about meeting uh, Grandma Tig. His name was James and her name was Jesse. Hey man, Jesse James, that's pretty good, ain't it? But uh, you know how they met? They met at a corn shucking, praise God. That's right, they'd have barn dances and the community would get together and shuck corn uh, and uh, they met at a corn shucking and uh, when they was just young people. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, Grandpa didn't mind telling me anything about them old stories and all of that stuff that he used to do. Uh, but when it come time to talk about the Lord, he didn't want anything to do with God. Come on now. He'd laugh and smile. He'd sit out under the oak tree uh, in his front yard and drink slits uh, 
malt liquor bull. Come on now. He'd laugh and he'd smoke his cigar and he'd tell you about the old days. Come on now. But when it come time to talk about Jesus, I seen more than one or two try to talk to him about the Lord. He'd shut his mouth and his face would glaze over and he'd have none of it. Come on and help me somebody. Oh God. Hey listen folks. If you live like a fool, you're going to die like a fool and you're going to spend eternity in a fool's hell. Come on. Amen. As the tree falls, so shall it lay. When your breath is gone, it'll be too late. Won't matter how much your girls cry or your boys weep or your grandchildren pray. It'll be over with. Huh? Not receiving the invitation from the king to go to the wedding. Oh, God. Uh, oh, God. Uh, it got the burden on my heart today how that you can come service after service. We love you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but it bothers me that I've never one time seen a tear run down your face. It bothers me that after all of this time, I've never seen you make one trip to the altar to talk to Jesus about your soul. Huh? What's hindering you? What's standing in your way? Whatever it is, why don't you weigh it against eternity? I'll tell you, eternity ought to win every time. Come on now. Amen, some of you. Amen, I feel like I'm preaching to somebody. You wouldn't even have to make that many changes. I said you wouldn't even have to do all that much changing to give your life to Christ. Just give your life to Christ and let him begin to work on you. Come on here. The devil will build it up in your mind. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. But I'm talking about a divine invitation, a divine supper, a divine wedding. Hallelujah. Don't let anything hinder you from making preparation to stand before God. I, uh, I'm sidetracked already and we end of this. In 1999, I had a friend in the church of God and I still have confidence in the guy. But uh, in 1999, he got sidetracked on uh, Y2K. Y'all remember that? Yeah, some of you ain't old enough to remember. Remember Y2K? All the computers are going to shut down. Everything's going to stop. I always wondered, you know, I was kind of scratching my head. If they, if they smart enough to invent them computers, who was the dummy that stopped the clock in 1999? That's what I said, you know. How, they wasn't too brilliant if everything's going to quit on January the 1st, 2000. Uh, my friend got sidetracked in that and he was going all over the southeast uh, teaching Y2K seminars. He was teaching them how to hoard up rice, hide gasoline. Huh? Uh, I had people in my family that wasn't even Christian as buying up cigarettes. They was afraid they wasn't going to get none when it turned 2,000. As digging holes in the backyard, burying water, hiding water, food stuff. Huh? One, before they sold their house, I had one family member had, had a big old, I don't know if y'all know what a kerosene drum is down here or not. We got a bunch of them up there where we're from. Big drum in the backyard. They fill it up with kerosene. That's how they heat the house. I had one family member. They, I went over there one day. They was out there. You know what they was doing? They was camouflaging that dude. They spread camouflage. And they going to put their gasoline in there. So when Y2K came, they was going to have gas. Nobody else in the neighborhood going to have gas. Come on, say amen. Huh? Big old drum, spray painted camouflage. It's getting ready for Y2K. I, I got to notice in my friend, you know, I, I preached in a lot of the same church as he did. People began to talk about that. Oh, have you sat through brother so-and-so's Y2K seminar? Man, it'll help you. He's, he's talking about all 
all kind of stuff. Come on now. I don't know. I probably preached at Dr. Zinley. Uh, Brother Jerry Griffin was there, I'm sure. All of that year, 1999, I was going behind that dude. Do you know what I was preaching? I was preaching out of the book of Amos. Amos said, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Come on here. Hey, Amen. You know what I was preaching? The most important preparation we can make in this generation is to prepare to meet God. That's back in 1999. Here it is, 2019. You know what I'm still preaching? The most important preparation that any generation can make is the preparation to meet God. David said, I've been young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous have to dig holes in the backyard and hide rice. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We get sidetracked. One went to his farm, another to his merchandise. They immediately began to, with one consent, to make excuse. Amen. They made light of it. What are you doing? Are you making preparation? Amen. To leave this world, it's about more than picking out headstones and sat uh, coffins come on now uh, it's about more uh, than what plot of ground you're going to be buried in uh, if it's under the oak tree uh, or in the sunshine uh, you better get your soul ready uh, that's the most important thing uh, this body's going to stay here uh, but that soul uh, is going to live forever going to live forever in heaven or in hell you can't change it and I can't change it either that breath that God breathed in us, we talked about last night. That's a never dying soul. And one of these days, that's going to come up before God. God don't want to put you in hell. Matter of fact, one man said, if you go to hell, you'll put yourself there. And that'll happen by the way you lived your life. If you refuse to accept the invitation, refuse to live for Christ, refuse to make your surrender to his will for your life, that you've tied the hands of God. And there's nothing more he can do. You see, he's a God of his word. And it doesn't matter how much Brother Teague likes you. It doesn't matter how much Brother Smith liked you. It doesn't matter what a great influence you've been in some church folks' family or life. It doesn't matter how much money you've given through the years to help this one, that one, or the other one. All that's going to matter, are you washed in the blood? Is your name written in heaven? Are you ready to stand before God in the judgment? I don't want to leave here lost. I don't want to leave here undone without God. I'm glad I heard the call. Huh? I'm glad I got in the chosen line. I, come on, say amen. You know what? I've met folks. I've seen folks. I've, I'm acquainted with folks. I know folks that the first time they came to the altar didn't satisfy them. And I know what I'm about to say is not popular preaching. And I know we, we receive him by faith. But I've met some folks, they'll tell you, they'll testify to you. It took some of them more than one trip to get their soul satisfied, to feel like it's washed in the blood. Some folks I've met in my travels, they, they talk like they prayed for weeks before they ever felt delivered and guilt free and, and washed and cleansed. Come on now. Hey, sir. Hey, ma'am. Let me give you some advice. I'm just a servant with the invitation. Come on now. Hey, man, make your preparation. Mark it out on your calendar. Get your dates right. Come on. Get your life right with God and get ready to stand before God. Hey, we love you, but we cannot love you the way he does. We appreciate you, but he appreciates you more. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hell, amen, wasn't even created for you and me. It was created for the devil and his angels, but rebellion 
rebellious humanity, uh, amen, runs headlong toward hell uh, in an effort not to have to live uh, according to the teachings of this book. Come on now. Uh, I want to go to heaven, don't you? Uh, I said I want to go to heaven. Hallelujah. You cannot just get a little religion and expect God to take you to heaven. I have seen people, and I, I'm going to quit, I'm going to close. I have seen folks through the years that barely made it in. Just barely. My brother got saved uh, way back in the mid 90s. Lisa and I got married in 1987, I guess. He and his wife, he's four years younger than me. He probably got married in 92, 93, 94, somewhere in there. And in the mid-90s, their marriage was in such terrible shape, they got to reaching out. They had been watching how God had worked in our life. They got to reaching out. I was invited to preach an Easter revival near our home, in a little town called Welcome. And it was at the Welcome Church of God. My brother and his wife brought their little baby, and they showed up that Easter Sunday morning. And thank God, it wasn't my preaching, but God, God's hand had them right where he wanted them. And they broke free from sin. They came to the altar. They shook loose from old things. Old things passed away. All things became new. Christ birthed them into the kingdom of God. They got really born again. And for several months, they was running good. I'm telling you, God was working in them just like he had worked in us. And things seemed like it was going real good. I don't know what happened, you know. One, one, one of the downsides of being a traveling evangelist when you've got family that's lost at home that you love is you're never there with them. You're always preaching to somebody else's family. But I uh, trusted God, depended on God. While I'm preaching to y'all, he'll send somebody to preach to mine. Hallelujah. And uh, I've prayed that way for years. But anyway, something happened. And they got to giving place to the devil again. And they fell in love with sin again. And that went on probably. They backslid and they stayed together probably eight or ten years, I guess. And then they started, I started hearing reports, you know, through the family grapevine. They was separated. They was dating other people. They was in divorce court. They hadn't got divorced. And one night my brother had found out that his ex-wife or the woman he was separated from, his wife, had started dating someone kind of unusual. And uh, he was already on all kind of medicine, sleeping pills, restless leg medicine, antidepressants, I guess. And he went to the liquor store and bought him a bottle of whiskey. And he went home and he sat down in his recliner and turned the television on, started drinking whiskey and smoking cigarettes. He fell asleep, set his house on fire. And the first responders said he made it to the door, but he couldn't get the deadbolt unlocked. They revived him on the scene, burned all over his body. We was way over on the coast of North Carolina, uh, probably 300 miles away when we got the phone call. And we rushed back as quick as we could. And uh, he lived about uh, 48 hours, maybe 72 hours after they revived him. And I'll never forget when I walked in that room, he is at uh, Wake Forest there in the center of our state at the burn center. And I'd have never known it was my brother except for his eyes. He swelled. His skin was black and charred. His flesh was cracked open. It's horrible. Horrible. When I came into his view, Lisa and I, he turned his eyes, and he, when he saw us, big tears welled up in him. It started streaming down his face. Thank you, Jesus. 
They had taken a breathing tube out of him so he could whisper a little. I know it was all just God. And I said, Bill, are you saved? Don't you want to pray? Get saved. Give your life to Jesus. And he, all he could do is just nod his head just a little. Yes. Pray for me. Pray with me. Lisa and I prayed with him. He made a profession to give his life to Christ. Y'all know my wife. She's kind of, she's a very persistent person. When she gets her mind on something, we probably stayed with him probably 20 minutes before some of the other family wanted to come in. We had to rotate around. And probably five or six times in that 20 minutes, Lisa's right over top of him saying, are you sure you got saved? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you gave your life to Jesus? Come on now. Oh, it's serious now. He's about to leave here. Come on now. All I can do is stand around and cry. Huh? Lord, help him. Are you sure? Do you know, Bill, is it settled? Do you know that it's finished? It's fixed? Are you ready to meet God? And every time he answered in the affirmative, yes, yes, yes. Come on, say Amen. And I'll tell you something, it wasn't too many hours after that until the entire family was gathered around his bed and he breathed his last breath and his, his body shut down. Come on here. But his soul went to meet God. Are you going to help me while I talk to you? Just barely made it in. Come on and help me somebody. I could tell you story after story after story. But I could also tell you of some folks who live very foolishly and they thought they was going to have time I'm right down at the end and the end came suddenly it came so swiftly there was no time to repent no time to pray no time to get things right and they left this world lost lost and undone without God what about you have you made your preparation I'll never forget I told you I'm quitting I'm, I'm quitting I was pastoring Lake Placid when we went there in 2000, they'd already had a Christian academy there for about 15 years before we got there. Kindergarten through 12th grade, just like you all have here. And uh, there's very high on Christian education. And uh, I'll never forget one Sunday morning between Sunday school and morning worship, uh, we had dismissed some of the Sunday school classes at the outer perimeter of the fellowship hall. And we was walking through the fellowship hall. The telephone rang. Telephone hanging on the wall. Started ringing. It's probably it's probably two thousand year two thousand. One of the sisters just casually went over, uh, answered the phone. Hello, New Life Holiness Church. And I seen her countenance change. I stopped. And I seen her countenance change. And I seen her start shaking her head no and, and big tears. And she screamed, no! And she collapsed on the floor. Well, when I found out what had happened, there was a boy who was raised in that church that graduated from that Christian academy just a couple of years before I got there. His family had backslid and began to play with the things of the world and that boy had got wild. He made him some friends in town, and one thing led to another. He got addicted to crack cocaine. And he was running, living that life, running, running, running the streets, night after night after night. And that Saturday night, before church that Sunday, there's a big fog down there. And that boy came home uh, at sometime after midnight, uh, one or two o'clock in the morning, and his mother and father was in the bed. He came home long enough to take a shower, change clothes. He's going somewhere else. And it's about three or four o'clock in the morning. He's headed toward the door. His daddy gets up and stands in the doorway and begs him, please, son, you don't look good. Don't go back out there. Please. His son, very argumentative, they said, Daddy, you better get out of the door. I'm, I, I, you know I'm leaving. I'm leaving. You better get out of the door, Daddy. And his daddy 
stepped aside and let him leave. He got in his pickup truck. It was in the winter time. He was uh, gathering oranges, picking oranges in that part of the country. And early, early in the morning, still dark, that heavy fog on, there was a loaded orange truck broke down a quarter mile from his house, sitting in the lane he was running in. And I believe they estimated he's probably running above 70 miles an hour. He run that little pickup truck. Never hit the brakes. Never seen it coming. Right up under the back end of that loaded orange truck. And it nearly decapitated him. They asked me to preach the funeral. One of the saddest, saddest funerals I've ever been a part of. Raised in a holiness church. Graduated from a Christian school. Constantly surrounded by the things of God. And refused the invitation. And I fumbled around and tried to find something comforting. But there was no comfort. Tried to, tried to say something helpful. But there was nothing helpful I could say. Huh? What a sad time. I'm going to tell you something. Every one of us is leaving this life. That's the appointment everybody here is going to have to keep. Now, let me ask you, is it well with your soul? Can you imagine how it must have been? I don't know. I haven't asked the details or, or if anybody was around or exactly what happened. I've left it all alone, but I've often fantasized or maybe mused in my mind, wondered what it was like when Brother Gene Smith left here, man on fire with the Holy Ghost, a tongue talker, a Holy Ghost preacher, a Bible doctrine man. Come on, say amen. A man that had clean hands and a pure heart. The Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. That's the way I'd like to leave here, folks. I said, that's how I want to leave here, praise God, with clean hands and a pure heart, and it's so easy. The Bible said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible said if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All you got to do is say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want you to save me. Would you save me? Would you come into my life? Would you teach me to live for you? Would you just be sincere about it and watch him work? Stand with me, would you, all over this place. The divine invitation. Oh, God. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. And uh, Brother David's going to get something together and play, just play very softly. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, please, maybe there's someone here tonight who would like to come to this altar. Say, Brother Tig, I'm ready to pray. I've put this off and I've put this off. God is moving in the lives of people I love. God is working all around me. I'm ready for it to be me. I'm ready to be saved. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. While your heads are bowed and the saints of God are praying, Brother David's going to get ready and play. This altar's open. I want you to come. Are you here and you need to be saved? Why will you keep putting it off? Why will you keep turning away? Come on to this altar. God bless you, young man. Brother Watson, would you get down there and pray with him? Is there somebody else? Is there somebody else here tonight? Say, preacher, I'm ready to pray. Quit going over in your mind all that it's going to take. You got to get past that. All it's going to cost you to live for Jesus. You got to get past that. Once you get to thinking about what it's going to cost you not to. Oh, that's a much higher price to pay. Not to live for Him. Because you're going to pay that price with your soul in hell throughout all eternity. It's the only choice he has. It's the only thing that can be done. That's not his will for you. That's not his plans for you. 
You're the only one that can stop him from doing what he desires to do in you. You see, he didn't make us robots to just blindly follow him, but he gave us will. He made us free moral agents. He wants us to follow him because we want to. To love him because we want to. To live for him because we want to. Is that what you want to do? Are you ready to give him your life? Step out right now. Come to this altar. Jesus' name. Thank God for this young boy. I appreciate him coming. But I feel like there's others. I would to God you'd find your release. Find your liberty. Find your freedom. To step out and come to Jesus. Don't die lost without God. Don't leave this world without God. He's going to get ready and sing. This altar's open. Come on, let's pray. Oh, God. You have an appointment to meet me, says God. I know the day and the hour, and I love you. This is the day to turn your life to me. You don't know what lays before you, but I know the way you take. Turn to me. Let me love you. Let my spirit wash over you. Let me help you this day. Don't turn me away, says God. Hiloma tarata koromoti ando romatai. Hrama ye, ye hiloma chite hilo. Yoloma yate la mata la matilio chimatai. Ye, la moshite loho ye hila shamai. The hour is late, says God. My spirit beckons you. Come to me. Come to me in this dark hour. The time is short. My coming is at the door. Oh, Cares of this life, pleasures of sin for a season, all amount to nothing in the vast time of eternity. There is no turning back. Come to me while you have a chance. And let me save you. I'm calling you this night. I call you again because I love you. But my grace is here for this time. Oh, God. Oh, God. Now's the time to pray. Now's the time. While he's reaching down to you, now's the time to reach up to him. Praise God. The Bible teaches us that no man can come unto him except the Spirit. Draw him. Is he drawing you? Is he calling to your heart? Oh, God. If you would respond, I believe he'd help you. I believe he'd move for you. Come on, talk to him. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, God. Oh, God.